This is Ham Radio Now, the most important amateur radio program on the internet. Nobody around to argue with me now. And this is episode 372, the Citizen Weather Observer Program. This is from the ARRL and Tapper Digital Communications Conference 2017 version back uh, last September 2017 in St. Louis. And this is the Sunday Seminar. It's going to be presented by Jerry Krager. Uh, his call sign is N5JXS. Jerry works mm, sort of for NOAA and sort of not. He'll, he'll explain. Uh, and it's going to come in two parts. Uh, part one, this one, uh, episode 372, is about APRS and all those weather stations that you see all over the place. You see them at ham fests. You see your friends have them. Maybe you've got one. Um, and it turns out they are part of the Citizen Weather Observer Program. I think I've got a website here for that. Yeah. I didn't know that existed, but it does. And if you've got a weather station, there's a pretty good chance you are a part of it. And then in part two, which is going to be episode 373, improving the Citizen Weather Observer Program. And it's pretty good, but it could be better. Uh, more and better data and uh, lightning strike reporting and maybe something for you to do. So that'll be coming up in part two. First, we'll just learn what it's all about in part one. Uh, Ham Radio Now is brought to you by you. If you enjoy the programs, you get something out of them. I'm earning my Yasme Foundation grant, <laughs> but that's not covering everything. Arvin is sitting up there. He'd like to hear from you. HamRadioNow.tv is the place to go. Uh, as you probably know, we did not run a Kickstarter for covering the Tapper Conference this year, so your contributions are especially appreciated. And now, let's go to St. Louis and uh, learn about the CWAP. All right. And George, you ready? As ready as you can be. Everybody out in the audience ready? Okay. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Jerry Krieger, and I am so thrilled and excited Jerry could accept this time. This is one busy fellow. So... Yeah, the last couple of weeks have been interesting. Yeah. <laughs> But I mean, for the past several years, like yep. I've been trying to get you to Dayton, but Dayton, you have another conference you have to go to. Yeah, there's a conflict around Dayton. We're, actually, it's not a conference. We have this little experiment that is focused around severe weather. And Dayton happens during severe weather season. And if I leave, I'll miss all the fun. <laughs> so there you go. So... Citizen Weather Observer Program, CWOP, has been around for a number of years, so it may be a program that you're familiar with. If not, you're going to get an introduction to it. So we've been doing citizen science for quite a while now. Hams have. So this is a good example of it, probably one of the first. Well, maybe there's some that go predate us, so let's not try to make too many uh, gregarious claims on that, but I know the Citizen Weather Program has been around since the mid 2000s. Early 2000s. Early 2000s. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here's an opportunity. So then also, you know, the DCC is an opportunity to bring people together. So Nathaniel and Jerry uh, fortuitously met at a lunch. <laughs> so here's Nathaniel wanting to put together a space weather system. Here's Jerry would like to get further the citizen weather program, Jerry and I have been talking about um, designing and uh, putting out as a kit or as a, uh, as a product a lightning detector so we can add to the citizen weather program. So the first half, he's going to talk about the citizen weather program, then take a break, and then we're going to do some oh, thinking, I, right? Yeah, brain, brainstorming or blame storming. I'm not sure which. <laughs> But there's always time for the blame storming, so that's okay. So uh, get your notebooks out because we're going to be doing some designing. How's that? So without further ado, Jerry, take it away. Thanks, Steve. So let's talk for just a minute about a couple of things that aren't citizen weather. Uh, one of the things that's kept me really busy over the last several weeks has been the plethora of uh, tropical cyclones in the Atlantic Basin. And... Uh, you know, there's an outside chance that I might still be worried about uh, one of these because it looks like, if I can figure it, this guy right here, who can't figure out where he wants to go or what he wants to be when he grows up, still has an opportunity to wander up into uh, this somewhere around the uh, northeast of, uh, portion of the United States. Now, why do I care? 
Well, for one, I did tropical cyclone uh, model development for over 20 years and spent a lot of time playing with that. So it, it's hard to get rid of that little element of my life. The other thing is I don't know how many people are uh, familiar with Civil Air Patrol. Yeah, I sort of thought so. I'm one of about three people in CAP that, as a professional meteorologist, provides operational support and information so that plans can be made, because if we have to go someplace, it can get fairly interesting. Now, over the last several weeks, we've had a total of four significant tropical cyclones in the what we call the Atlantic Basin, which includes the uh, uh, Gulf of Mexico. And the, Atlantic, the uh, North Atlantic Basin and Gulf of Mexico region has never seen four tropicals, active hurricanes, category one or higher at the same time. We certainly have never seen any all massing category three or higher at the same time. I'm not prepared yet to say that this is a result of global warming or, glo or climate change, but one of the projects I worked on with tropical cyclones in the past is looking at that, and that's a phone call I'm going to make when things calm down a little bit and see what it, if they predicted this season to be as active and if it's based on warming. Anyway, what you have here is the water vapor imagery from uh, GOES-13. Jose is still wandering around in the Atlantic. This is the, uh, all of today UTC uh, data. I can go for, back farther. And uh, what you see in here is this, the uh, rotation can, uh, persists. We don't have a well-defined eye. We do have a warm core storm, which means it's still a hurricane or tropical storm. And that's unlikely to change any time in the near future. The eye is not horribly well-defined, but you've still got the bands. And when this storm finally decides to hit land, it's going to be eh, interesting. Now. We'll look at this very briefly, and then we'll go, we will stop boring you with the operational side. I normally spend something on the order of two to four hours in the morning looking at this just to get a handle on what the forecast is really going to be. We're not going to do that. Oh, yeah. And we have another one that's progged to pop up and become an, a significant storm and go right back over on Antigua and Barbuda again. Yeah, it's not something they need. It looks like it's going to pass a little off to the east of uh, Puerto Rico again. So they'll probably be spared uh, most of the damage. You have Jose right in here trying to figure out where it's going to go. And I thought I had turned the speed up on this. This looks awfully slow. Let me deal with my adult ADHD here. <laughs> And it looks like uh, it's not going to be the same track as Sandy, but it's going to dwell off New York for a while and probably push quite a bit of water back up into uh, the uh, New York Harbor, Staten Island, and uh, sort of make a mess of, of uh, that area one more time, if this model is going to be correct. This is only one model. The National Hurricane Center runs about 30 models. I look at about three of them. Uh, I also look at the uh, European model uh, from the European Center for Mesoscale Meteorological Forecasting, uh, or Mesoscale Weather Forecasting, the uh, United Kingdom Met Office model. There's a bunch of models that we look at and evaluate, and somewhere in there, in my mind, I try and figure out what the correct track is, what the weighted path is going to be for, for the storm, what the intensity is going to be. Anyway. Yes. Question, the red line that has, is that an isobar? No, that's not. That's actually, th this shows the thickness between the 1,000 hectopascal and 500 hectopascal uh, regions. And that is where you're starting to see a, uh, fi the 500 hectopascal thickness become, th that thickness is becoming a little tighter. So if you're going to look for uh, th this is sur really just a surface plot, and this isn't where the steering currents come from. I look at the 850 hectopascal, 700, and 500 
uh, upper air charts and do what's just this side of a pure arithmetic mean of uh, the winds and pressures to come up with uh, steering currents. That's just what I've learned over, yeah, 20 odd years or 20 odd years. But by the time uh, Jose gets up here, it'll be in significantly cooler water and will become a cold core storm. And we will classify it as extratropical, just like we did Sandy. Uh, you know, they, they removed the, the moniker Hurricane from Sandy just before it went ashore. Anybody remember how much damage it did? So we're still debating whether that was a good call. When we were looking at Sandy coming ashore on satellite imagery on the infrared, it, it appeared to still be a warm core storm, but because it had spent so much time over cold water, they uh, told us it couldn't possibly be. Okay. My, so launching into the uh, citizen weather talk, and by the way, I'd prefer an interactive forum. So questions? Don't hesitate. Yes, sir. You mentioned the classification of extra tropical. I think there's another classification called subtropical. They're about the same. About the same? Okay. Yeah. Uh, an extratropical storm means it's no longer a warm core storm. A subtropical storm has about the same uh, connotation. Okay. A tropical cyclone is a warm core storm. And if you take a look at the cloud tops, especially over the, uh, over the core of the storm, you will see that they are much warmer than they would be for a thunderstorm. Thunderstorm, you take a look at that, even, even what we call a mesocyclone, the big rotating system, the mesocyclonic systems, the MCSs, have a very cold top. As they get higher, they get colder. Well, because of the eye formation, as, the top, as long as the top is, dis is a distinct wall of cloud, you'll actually see a warm core in the midst of that. And you'll have a much warmer region after as the eye passes over. You go, in, in the ideal world, you go to calm winds and it warms up on you. And then the wind picks up and it starts cooling off as you get more humidity uh, reintroduced before the uh, eye wall passes the second time. Now, I don't have pictures of it. I kind of wish I did because it's cool. But uh, one of my colleagues, who's just a little insane, has driven through the eye walls of both Harvey and Irma recently in a pickup truck laden with instruments, gone into the eye and launched weather balloons with radiosons. That was the second and third time this has been accomplished. The first one was picked up in, in Harvey in the, into the eye wall, so he's got a picture on what we call the hodograph of a perfect circle and meeting itself again as it goes up. Now, the meteorological value of that outside of pretty pictures for a conference is almost nil. <laughs> but the one he got in Irma was pretty much smack dab in the, mental, in the middle of the eye, and it was almost a perfectly straight ascent, almost no turn in the hodograph, and we were able to see some very interesting data from that on the actual profile of humidity, temperature and humidity, and virtual temperature all the way up. So that's some of the thing, that's one of the things. Not everybody at the lab does what I do, sit in, front, sit in a dark room in front of a computer screen and make Cray's happy. Uh, he goes out and builds instruments and does things. So we've got a whole variety of, of functions that go on at the Severe Storms Lab. So I am from uh, the National Severe Storms Laboratory. I work for the money laundering division of the University of Oklahoma. <laughs> it, it, it's referred to as a cooperative institute. We are... Hiring people within the federal government is a tedious, difficult process because of the budgetary uh, constraints. The cooperative institutes are designed to help bring people in with certain areas of expertise, knowledge, experience, and help staff up the, the uh, laboratories within NOAA. It's a very special relationship. And if you walk down the hall in, in uh, my office area, you can't tell that I work, uh, officially work for OU because all it says on my door card is NSSL. It's a really neat way to, to do things. So, 
Where did we start with uh, citizen weather? Back around 1990, Bob had an idea. He wanted to track harbor patrol boats. And packet was new, being used for all sorts of things for which it really didn't work. And we didn't have an application that defined it. We had BBSs. We still have BBSs, and BBSs have a lot of utility. We have other things that we can do with uh, packet radio that have a lot of utility, but they're not, oh, wow, golly gee whiz. APRS qualified for that. Now, as a network weenie in a previous life, when I look at AX25, it makes me think I've gone back about 50 years. Yes. <laughs> uh, you know where I'm coming from. Actually, we had some very interesting impacts on X.25. Some of the things that Bob came up with with addressing for point to multipoint, point to point, the concept of repeaters were not embedded into the European version of X.25 and have subsequently gone into the standard. You just don't see that happen very often from the European side of things in the standard process. Bob identified a way to make this point to multipoint with broadcasting that was really pretty useful and a lot of people thought it was cool. The original application was indeed tracking, but you know, we've sort of expanded beyond that. Bob keeps coming up with ideas of, how, of what we should do. Maybe we should put mile markers in there and embed those. Fire stations, weather. Uh, identify an accident. Identify a, a hiker. Track the Appalachian Trail. Whatever you've got, Bob's probably thought of it, implemented it, and told people how it should best be done. This includes planes, trains, and automobiles. The occasional satellite, a space station or two, space shuttles, and I've actually put APRS on cows. I am published for having achieved sub-bovine accuracy in locating cows. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, balloons. APRS is the de facto standard for high altitude balloons these days. There are some other folks trying to say spot the, the spot trackers are the best way to go. A lot of people use those as a backup, but they depend on APRS to actually be able to find their payload when they're done. APRS does have a permanent spot on ISS, and we did play with it on shuttle during the shuttle amateur radio experiment. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, the last spec, publi truly published spec I've been able to find, circa 2000, was the gathering of all the folks who were writing code, uh, primarily in Windows, with uh, a little bit of Mac code. Is that correct, John Ackerman? Um, I, I've learned the year out as a really bad memory. <laughs> <laughs> and I respect you for it. John Ackerman took a Herculean a task of bringing together incredible, diverse, and I'm being very polite here, minds and actually weaseling out this specification. Is that close? Well, the, the real truth is that Greg Jones used his persuasive skills to literally yeah, John, block everyone. Microphone. Uh, yeah. Greg Jones used his persuasive skills to literally lock people in a room, a windowless room, in the airport hotel at BWI and not let us out until w there was agreement. And that is a very close to, to the true story of what happened. The really true story I can't talk about. <laughs> so, yeah. so you have to consider in developing a standard like this that you can't really get all of the important people interested. And, and thus, if you're really lucky, first of all, we probably didn't even know what metrology was. Um, we, we understood what meteorology was, the half of us who didn't think it had something to do with meteors. And um, so if, if you're lucky we put into this standard a way to extend it, but that's all that you can get in, in this kind of thing. And 
You also have to realize that APRS is actually used by a lot of people who don't even understand that it's APRS, who are not radio amateurs and who have never had an input to the standard either. Yeah, the, the, the rather pointed comment that I put in there about neither meteorologists nor metrologists were involved was because weather was a key element that was going to be uh, addressed here. And the decisions were made by folks writing the code who hadn't studied it. That was something that I, where I had offered to at least review and, and try and have input. And I was told, well, you don't write software for Windows. You're right, I don't. And uh, go away. But that becomes important when you start talking about how we're handling the data now because we are trying to incorporate the, these data into data sets that go to real meteorologists. And we have to field the occasional question about, well, how come I can't get a tenth of a degree? For those of you who are wondering, yes, a tenth of a degree matters to some of the people I have to deal with on a daily basis. So if you look at Find You, Find You has been around since slightly before the creation of the universe. <laughs> and, uh, would have been nice if Steve Dempsey was here, but if he was going to be anywhere right now, he'd be down in the Keys trying to see what his house looks like. I don't know how many of you took a look at uh, the pictures he posted on Facebook yesterday, I believe, but his house is essentially intact, and it looks like he'll probably be able to uh, renovate and rebuild. So that's a good thing. Steve's been collecting APRS data and doing fun things with it for a long time, and you mentioned, Bruce, that... Uh, there are a lot of people using these data. Steve has been able to commercialize some of the skills he's done with APRS uh, data collection and uh, the GIS representations, and has done quite well with that. Not bad for a, a uh, reformed emergency room doc. He immediately, though, started harvesting the weather data, and he figured out a way <coughs> which is still in place today. It's called FTP push. Does anyone remember FTP? Yeah. Okay. He collects the data and pushes it to Matus every 15 minutes. And that happens to be our rate limiting step for how fast you can report your data. That's not necessarily bad though. That's a whole lot faster than most of the weather service sites actually update their data. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, if you look, how many people have ever looked at, the, at, at something called a METAR? What time is usually on the METAR? There's a time stamp on it. When, does it. when is it normally issued? Pardon? Five before the hour. Uh, between eight minutes before the hour and four minutes before the hour. And this was because, once upon a time, when the Earth's crust was still cooling, <laughs> Everything was done on teletype, on leased lines. It's the reason we were shouting on our broadcast messages from the Weather Service until just this year. This year, yes. Yes, this year, we stopped shouting. Um, so once an hour is the standard with special observations that can be kicked off by the automated uh, information systems for significant changes like wind reversal or precipitation started or lightning struck the station. Something like that will generate a special. Once upon a time, back around 2003, Matus, which was run by uh, a couple of scientists, Patty Miller and Mike Barth, and they were the sole support of Matus, took a look at this and, yes? What's Matus? Oh, I'm sorry. I should have expanded that. It's the Meteorolo Meteorological Assimilation Data Ingest System. <laughs> yeah, let's leave it at Matus. It, it, it describes everything that Matus does. Unfortunately, it's absolutely unintelligible to people who don't do data assimilation. What, what it does is it brings data in from all over the place and puts it in a common format so that we can incorporate it into models or look at it on the uh, workstations that the forecasters use, or so that researchers at the university level can look at it and tease out data that they want. It's, a, it's not just uh, citizen weather. It involves road weather, uh, the uh, 
there's a, there's a system called AMDAR, or TAMDAR, used to be AM, AMDAR, they also have the ACARS system, where, they send, where airplanes, airliners, send meteorological data down. And that's turned out to be very useful because we get the same sort of profile in temperature and humidity and wind data uh, from TAMDAR that we get from launching a balloon, except we get it with a very high frequency around major airports. So, you know, stuff like that. The, the data sets, I can't even remember all the data sets that Matus has. I could go look them up if somebody's interested at the break, I'll do that. But there's a bazillion data sets in there. And some of them can't be released to the public. Uh, the uh, weather bug, or uh, yeah, the weather bug network cannot be released to the public because they sell that to the weather service and they would like to sell that to everybody else. But if you go to their website, you can look at it. Russ Chadwick worked with Patty and Mike. He was actually sort of a troubleshooter engineer and meteorologist for uh, Dr. Sandy McDonald, who ran what was then the Forecast Systems Laboratory. Now, we changed change lab names periodically and know how to save money or have the, give the appearance of saving money. Um, but Russ worked directly for Sandy. He'd known him for most of his career and fixed problems Sandy identified. He went to Sandy and he said, I'm starting to see all this weather data out on APRS. What if we were to capture that and plug it into Matus? After a brief scuffle with Patty and Mike, who said we don't have the processing power and there's only two of us, Sandy said, that's a great idea, go do it. At that point, Russ was given 10% of his time to babysit this burgeoning enterprise, or up to 10%, and uh, Patty and Mike got no extra time and no extra help to, <laughs> to incorporate it into Matus, but they managed to do so anyway. Uh, at this point, the weather station suddenly got official NOAA recognition. You got a registration ID. You got a WMO, World Meteorological Organization ID. So if you've got a ham call sign, you have three different IDs that you go by for your weather data. Four if you're using SSIDs to shred these things out farther. And they all have a spot in the database that are important to us. This official recognition means that your data is actually going to be blessed and used by NOAA, and it's something that provided us with a whole lot more information than we had, than our forecasters had on the ground. So, yes? Pardon my naivete about this, but okay. how can you trust us? <laughs> Crowdsourcing. If, yeah, the, the, if I get more and more reports from yeah, if, I, if I've got an isolated CWAP report from out here on a mountain ridge that consistently shows wind values that are much higher than everybody surrounding him, somebody asks that question. And then I go, identify the site on Google Earth or call the guy on the phone and say, so what's going on? He says, well, I'm at 6,400 feet on top of a mountain ridge, and my, my anemometer is at 10 meters, and it's a professionally installed site, on and on and on and on. It's like, I trust that one now. It's crowdsourcing. That's really the answer. Matus applies several tests to a lot of the data. The barometry, temperature, and humidity we can all quality check with simple measures. We do nearest neighbor checks, compare it to the nearest neighbor. Is it good? Yeah, probably pretty, uh, then it's probably okay. Reasonableness check. If your temperature is reading 341 degrees Fahrenheit, I am not going to give that a go. I'm not gonna discard the data, but I'm gonna flag it as this is probably bad. If your barometer is reading 941 hectopascals or millibars, and you are in, at sea level in central Kansas, there's a very high likelihood that you've got a barometer problem. 
So we can track these, and what Matus does is applies the quality checking. They, they do nearest neighbor, they do reasonableness, and then they do also a temporal uh, reasonableness check. If you have a very, very rapid change to something that is way out of scale, it gets flagged. But we don't ever remove the data because Patty and Mike came in with the, with the uh, premise that all data are precious. You might have an outlier, but it might actually be accurate, and it's up to the scientist to interpret that. You shouldn't just arbitrarily say, oh, I'm going to QC this one and fix it. Don't give me the raw data. I want the raw data. I, that's the way my mind works. So we've talked about why you have at least two IDs. You've got uh, what you see is the ham call sign and then A-P-A-R-A-S-A-T-A-U. Uh, and in that case, you really only have two because the A something or other corresponds to a valid NOAA ID and a, a valid uh, WMO ID, World Meteorological Organization. And then you know what your call sign is. That one's pretty obvious. The folks who don't have call signs, on the other hand, or the ones who don't read all the way through the sign-up page on WXQA.com and don't give us their call sign, end up with a CW or DW, actually now an FW is the latest place we're at. So we've got a lot of people registered. And they have one that's FW and four characters, one that's F and four characters. And those, the FW corresponds to a valid NOAA ID, the F corresponds to a valid WMO ID, and all these get reported back to the World Meteorological Organization. So if somebody in Europe goes and pulls the data set, they know that they can't assign that ID to another station. So how does the data get to us? By RF, goes to I gates and then to the core servers, assuming the I gate is talking to a core server at some point. Directly into the core servers or tier two servers. Or it can go directly to any of the seven? No, I'm sorry, I'm up, yeah, seven. I'm at seven right now, dedicated citizen weather servers. Why do we break out the citizen weather servers? Because we got to a point with 486 technology that the computers couldn't keep up on the co in the APRS core to all of the periodic weather reports and the routine stuff coming in from the uh, true APRS data for tracking or messages or signposts. So <coughs> we broke it off and made other data, uh, other servers and created a separate network and there's actually intercommunication between them, but the CWAP servers do not push data back out to the uh, APRS servers. Find you harvests data from all the CWAP servers and all the core servers. Steve dumps it in a database, periodically extracts the file uh, to a file and pushes that file via, yes, FTP with an open pa actually, password, actually, yep, open password to a public site available primarily for this purpose only, and NOAA harvests it there. So where do you get a weather station from? Well, if it can be made to talk to the internet in some fashion, and if some enterprising soft uh, coder has written code for it, just about anything will work. There's actually one meteorologist in Pittsburgh, I know, I believe he left his weather station when he moved from the Indianapolis area, who had a retired airport weather station, the Automated Weather Observing System site, in his backyard for his CWAP station. No, we didn't question his uh, quality. Uh, he had a 10-meter tower. The neighbors complained about it. He said, I'm a meteorologist. I've got to have it. And they went, okay. Um, there, there's all sorts of people making weather stations now, rain-wise. Uh, basically, get a hold of me if you've got a question about one, and I'll try and answer. I make some interesting phone calls. 
So the common attributes are that they're automated. In other words, I don't want you coming back to your computer every 15 minutes and typing the data in in an APRS uh, standard packet. They're able to compile obs each observation into the APRS compatible format that actually meets the spec. That's been an interesting challenge. You'd, I probably talk to a dozen, maybe two dozen people a year who are writing their own code for their own purpose and will probably have a user base of in less than five who can't seem to follow it and, and when it says the ca uh, character space for this is three characters long, it's like, well, I've got five characters. Why, can, why is it three characters? I don't want to truncate it. Truncate it, please. That's what the spec says. It's not store and forward. So if you store up a full day's worth of data, the last one that you send when you connect up again is the only one we're going to record. And it's the only one we're going we're to put a time, the same time stamp on all of those. We're only going to record the last one. Now, most of our reports are sent directly. Some stage into a central server. Uh, the uh, new Davis systems have a central server, and they go there, and then comes back out. Rainwise, I think, also is doing that. They're, but for the most part, they're sent directly to one of the APRS or, or uh, CWAP servers. And when I say APRS, I'm, I'm including the Tier 2 group also. They've got over 90 servers scattered around the world. Now virtually all are in professional data centers. It's a well-managed organization. They're much larger than the APRS core, but the APRS core remains, well, the core. It's where we started, and I manage that, and we are just trying to keep it all going professionally. I'm working real well with the Tier 2 folks. That wasn't always the case, and that was one of the reasons I ended up managing the core was because I could get yelled at and either yell back or just let it roll off. So the Tier 2 folks have done some marvelous things. They're actually doing with their distributed network something that I think needed to be done. And if you look at where the APRS core servers are, they're scattered all over the world now. We have redundancy, we have geographic diversity, we have them in data centers all over the world that have high level redundant power and uh, multi-pathway IP access. So we're doing pretty good. And the core servers can, in fact, uh, with today's technology, handle 100% of the load that we get and never fall over. Any one of the core servers is still capable of handling the entire load, but we distribute it out to about 10 servers so that we make sure that we've got that geographic diversity and overall redundancy. So what does a weather station look like? This is a Davis Vantage Pro, and the Vantage Pro 2 is very similar. It, uh, they, they've started adding bird spikes to the uh, rain gauges because birds like to foul the gauge mesh inside. Bugs will do that too. Someone was recounting that they have a rain gauge near a, uh, a, red, a redwood tree, and for some reason, it keeps filling up with needles. So imagine that. What you have is the anemometer and wind direction system right here. Anemometer is the, this is a cup anemometer. Uh, you've got power for the, for the remote system. Rain gauge, this is a tipping bucket style rain gauge. Barometer is in here. <laughs> Excuse me. Temperature and uh, humidity are out here. All of this can connect wirelessly to the console. The console has a, uh, an e a uh, port, either serial or ether. I think they're, what are they? They are, what they want you to do now is connect an ethernet uh, cable to their uh, uh, system and let it talk to their server and then they'll send it back to us. Yeah, that works okay. Adds about three seconds of latency into your report. I can live with three seconds. Typically, it's mounted something like this. So you've got anemometry a little higher. You've got everything else as an all-in-one unit. This shield is a radiation shield around the temperature and humidity gauges. Why? The sun. 
but it's because we've got rules about these sorts of things. A long time ago, we used Stevenson shields and cotton shields, which are uh, large wooden boxes, and we put aneroid uh, barometers and regular mercury thermometers and, uh, in, in there, and we actually had a sling psychrometer, and you took that out and you flung it around above your head. And that every, somebody did that every hour. Now we have the automation, but because all of this was protected from direct sunlight, from what we call insulation, we still do that. It's also one of the reasons we still use a cup anemometer, because we haven't figured out how to integrate some of the sonic anemometers, the high-performance sonic anemometers, into our historical data set. So we do it the same way we did it from time immem Well, actually, it started in 1861. Uh, who was responsible for the first meteorological observations for the uh, United States government? Any guess? No, not, not the official observations as, as a systematic effort. It really doesn't go back that far. Nope. The Army Signal Corps. Oh, of course. <laughs> The Army Signal Corps had an officer assigned to take a weather observation each day starting in 1861. It was probably some second lieutenant who didn't have anything else to do. <laughs> but that's how far back we go. Now, as I said, something like this appeared in the backyard of a friend of mine who's now up in Pittsburgh as, the, uh, uh, as a meteorologist and the... Uh, information technology officer in that office. Now, as an aside, he recertified launching weather balloons recently because his office is down to seven people. It's supposed to be staffed at about 20. They're a little short-handed, so he's doing everything again, just like he did when he was an intern. For this, you've got a few other sensors. You've got velocity and anemometry, uh, anemometry and direction up here at 10 meters present weather, runway visual range, you have temperature, pressure, and humidity here, and it all goes to a phone line, and that phone can be dialed and occasionally calls home to mother once an hour or with special reports. Pilots can call in and get a voice report of what the current weather is. There's another system called ASOS, the Automatic Surface Observing System, which is reporting at 20 minute intervals and is not federally funded or maintained. We have the occasional problem with these in, this, in uh, aviation because eh, they aren't always paying attention to engineering detail. We had one, one case in Texas where I found the exhaust, the equipment exhaust fan blowing into the intake of the uh, temperature sensor. <laughs> that biased the temperature readings about 15 degrees high. 15 degrees Celsius high. <laughs> and you wonder how I can trust a ham radio operator to give me data? You've got a, you know, what this is is just sort of a, a plethora of stations. This is from Texas Weather Instruments. They've got a nice little NEMA box right here that holds the uh, barometer and the uh, electronics to send things home, and of course the ubiquitous solar cell, a small tipping bucket rain gauge, the uh, solar shield, and an all-in-one anemometer and wind direction. This can be put in a compact spot like, it did, like they show here. It's actually usually spaced out considerably better. This is the instrument that I use from Visala. It's all-in-one. Everything's in here and you can put it out in the middle of nowhere. Up at the top, there's a, what they call a rain cap. That rain cap is a uh, microphone, effectively. It's been calibrated, and they count raindrops. They can also identify hail. They can't determine how much hail, but they can identify that they have hail impacting the, uh, the rain cap. And this is effectively be, uh, 
a dis, what we call a distrometer because it can uh, differentiate between different droplet sizes, and that allows them to do a numerical summation and come up with uh, the volume of rain, uh, you know, the rain accumulated over time. And it actually works pretty well. I've, I've tested it in a variety of environments. I've actually tested it against known uh, sensors with uh, tipping buckets and weighing gauges, and it, does, it actually does better than they advertise. So we got documentation on how we would like to see this stuff put in place. Of course, Noah's got a document about it. It's about 13 chapters. I'm sorry, 13 volumes. And the WMO uh, texts are actually longer, but about the same 13 volumes, because FMH1 and WMO1 are pretty, well, pretty much parallel documentation. The sighting guide was originally written by Russ Chadwick and Dave Helms. Dave was at the Office of Science and Technology Planning at the Weather Service at the time. I did a, a, a review on it. We made a bunch of edits to it. Tim Oak from uh, the Canadian Meteorological Organization wrote a document on sighting weather stations in urban environments. It's the WMO81 document here. And what that basically means is we've got rules for how things are supposed to be put in place so that they're all uniform, so that we can all relate them to the historical record. We got rules for citizen weather, but we they're not hard and fast rules. They're really recommendations. For temperature and humidity, don't put it up right next to the brick. Don't put it right next to your exhaust fan. Don't put it right over your uh, uh, air conditioner. Not too close to buildings. Not, not over asphalt, concrete, warm or hot exhausts. Preferably over grass, grass that's representative of your local area. So if that means your yard, put it over the yard, that's great. If it means you're out in the Kansas prairie, put it over prairie grass and see that it gets mowed every year. <laughs> no, really, I mean, it's, you know, what, what else? For the rain gauge, not too close to building or fences because it's gonna be shadowed and you're not gonna get that in. Not situated where objects will obstruct the rainfall. In other words, don't put it under the tree, put it away from the tree. Yeah, there are suggestions. Why? Because we're asking people for their data. They're volunteers. There's not any regulation that says you've got to do it this way like we have for the airports. And even some of the airport systems I've seen are not up to snuff, really. We would like to get the best data possible. And if you call me up and say, how do I cite my weather station? I'm going to tell you what my recommendations are, and they're going to be based on, on FMH1. And then they'll reference back for practicality to Tim Oak's document. And then as a, as a last resort, I'm going to say, and take a look at the CWAP citing guide, because that tells you what is adequate. But if you ask me what I'd like to see, I'm going to give you the, the hardcore answer. The guidelines that we have are based on professional guidelines and professional rules. So we didn't just draw the, the CWAP stuff out of thin air, even though we're all trained in, in, you know, trained professionals on a closed course. But we didn't just make it up. We work with this stuff all the time, and this is what we're trying to do, is make the, get the best data possible out of it. We know that not everybody in an urban setting is going to be able to meet the guidelines. We will work with you to try and improve your sighting so that you can get it better. We really, really need, however, metadata. How high is your anemometer? Where in relation to your house is the rain gauge and the temperature sensor? How far from obstructions is the anemometer? That, that's something people don't think about. How many antenna geeks do I have in here? So when I start talking about near field and far field, you've got a clue of what I'm talking about. The near field for wind is considered to be 10 times the height of the nearest obstruction. Now, yeah, that's a long distance, isn't it? Now, we've got a problem with this because nobody has actually figured out what the critical frequency for anemometry is. And it turns out to be a slightly bigger problem than one might think. I actually spent 
a summer with an undergraduate student working on this where we collected data, small data sets, large data sets, and tried to look at wind velocity and figure out what the Nyquist frequency was. Yeah. I don't have enough data yet to do that, and I don't have a, a fast enough sample rate from my sonic anemometers to do it. I'm going to have to buy some expensive sonic anemometers to actually get to the point. I, I believe it's going to be, yes? Finish your thought. I think we're going to be looking at about, oh, one hertz being the critical sample frequency for the study, and, oh, probably about 0.01 hertz being the critical sample frequency for, I'm sorry, I'm looking at uh, 60 hertz for this critical sample frequency for the study and about 0.1 to 0.01 hertz being the critical sample frequency for anemometry overall once we identify the Nyquist free value. Right. So a sonic anemometer is basically a microphone? A sonic anemometer is a three or four point multi-baseline system that emits a sonic, uh, a string of sonic impulses and measures both the Doppler shift and the time of arrival uh, on the two baselines, or three baselines, or four baselines. Kind of depends on how the sonic is done. Uh, gosh, if I had a whiteboard. So imagine, if you will, you have a perfect triangle, an equilateral triangle here, and you have emitter, receiver, receiver, and you know that the baseline here is pointed due north. So you can do the math and you can come up with velocity and direction out of that. You gotta sample it really fast. Now, because we have this historical record bias, we've done everything we can to convince the world that actually we're taking, that, that wind velocity is best treated as an integrated value and we don't need to know what a critical frequency is. So if you go back 400 or so years, how did we measure wind, wind velocity? We looked at, sir? We, we, we looked at a rope or a tree limb suspended by a rope and how far did it deflect? It was an integrated value. Was it really useful? Well, yeah, it was, because it said, you know, the average over some time, time interval that we don't know gave us a velocity of this. And over time, we were able to calibrate that, and we've put instruments in wind, chain, uh, in wind tunnels, and we've been able to say the actual flow in meters per second or feet per second or inches per furlong is this, and calibrate those instruments. But at what frequency should we be measuring that? Well, I can find data in the literature for radar measurements of wind using Doppler radar, and they use terms like Nyquist. But I can't really find anything in the signal processing data or in the physical meteorology that says, and this is how we ought to be looking at wind, at, at the anemometry. So right now I'm in the data collection phase and I'm trying to convince my boss to buy me a couple of new anemometers that sample at, oh, maybe 100 hertz or, two, or 250 hertz. I'll take them. I get that. Then I can start oversampling to the point where I will probably start seeing something besides just noise. But we come back to, to finish this up, metadata on your site installation are very important to us. The more you can tell us, the more we're going to document, the better it is. Yes, sir. Uh, is if, how do we provide that to you, and how is it tied to our station record? Uh, when you register, anything you tell us about it, now there, there are a couple of places where it goes. Uh, you can record these data with Philip Gladstone uh, on Gladstone Family's weather site, because he is the unofficial repository of pictures and better ways to position yourself on Google Maps. Uh, and he's a volunteer. I'm a volunteer for this. Yep. That the five percent of my time and no more can be dedicated to this at work. If I go past that, they yell at me and take points off my evaluation. <laughs> if I don't do that, they yell at me and take points off my evaluation. <laughs> 
But Philip is purely a volunteer and has done a lot of uh, additional quality checking, notification of people, maintaining list serves to notify people when their data go out of spec or when they stop seeing data, uh, keeping the metadata in hand. We also have uh, a record of the metadata at CWAP registration in Boulder where a, uh, an overworked staff that is allowed to dedicate 10% of their time to citizen weather is working. Uh, so, and, I, and I've been looking at schemas, XML uh, schemas and database uh, schemas to try and better manage the metadata. We're try we've been talking about this for about five years. When NOAA comes up with funding so that I can dedicate three months to it, I'll, I'll finish the thing out. It's about a three-month process for me to do the database on that. It's because it's all stuff I've done before. It's a, it's a matter of going back and picking pieces from the projects that worked and discarding pieces from the projects I discovered failed miserably. So we talked about this at some length. Clear of obstructions, at least 10 times the tallest obstruction. So you've got to be 500 feet away from that 50-foot tree that you love so much. Or cut it down. Well, my wife wouldn't let me do that. I tried. Uh, sighted over native grass covering. This is assuming you have grass. If you're out in the middle of the Mojave Desert and you have cactus over here and sand all around you, well, then mow the sand, please. Thou shalt not sight over asphalt or concrete, and if you have to put that concrete pad where your weather station's been, relocate your uh, weather station a ways away from the concrete. The re-radiation is, is a real bear. Anemometry traditionally is at 10 meters. Why? Because we've always done it that way. <laughs> it does actually get it out of some of the boundary layer effect but only at night when the boundary layer descends to, oh, maybe about 10 meters in some places. That doesn't, yeah, in the daytime, the boundary layer is good to six, seven, eight thousand 8,000 feet. It uh, doesn't matter. Uh, we've had this argument, by the way, the, uh, the fire weather stations all measure their wind at six feet. Any idea why? face height. If a firefighter is going to be in that wind and suddenly get a blast of smoke or heat, they want to know what it is at his face. So when I was trying to discuss with them what was the, the appropriate height for it, that they've, they've got exactly one answer, and they don't want to hear anything else. We have exactly one answer in, in uh, the standard meteorology world. Now, our incident meteorologists who go out with the firefighters are perfectly willing to work with whatever they get. And some, by the way, sometimes it's five feet, sometimes it's six feet, sometimes it's four and a half feet. It depends on where the guy with the Kestrel anemometer holds it up and, you know, it's above my head, it must be six feet. I can see it down here. So there's a little variability for the, for the uh, fire weather. Just curious, uh, if you take all the obstructions out of the equation and just normalize for boundary layer relative to ground height, is there a transfer function that's been defined that, you know, 10 meters versus 6 feet? Yes. Okay. There is, and like everything else that I play with, it's a uh, partial differential solution with no numerical completeness. So... But, but yes, we can make that approximation, and I have done that on occasion to report the 10-meter uh, anemometry for a couple of sites. And when I'm discovered, they usually slap my hand. <laughs> Rain gauge is supposed to be roughly two to three feet, depending on the type of gauge, above the ground. And that is regardless of whether you use a flexible wind fencing, so the idea of the rain gauge is whatever falls incident without the impact of the wind. So bl wind blowing rain into the rain gauge, eh, doesn't do you much good. But can you stop it? Well, no, because if you put the fence up too high, you're going to completely obstruct what's happening, and you'll actually see uh, the wind move the rain around the fence, obst obstructing it. We already talked about the uh, temperature sensor radi and uh, bar uh, barometry, and for that matter, humidity protected from direct sun's uh, rays. So that's what the NWS 
looks like uh, NWS station siting looks like in a nutshell. It's about mm, 70 pages to, of uh, information to get to this. Most of the NWS sites are at airports. Why? It's a big, wide open space, and people need the information at the airports. That's where we land airplanes. That's where a lot of this started, get originated from for the uh, standardization. The FAA pays for this. If the FAA pays the NWS to put a site someplace, they're going to do it. Absolutely guaranteed. And you got plenty of room if you want to stretch out. You saw what the ASOS uh, uh, site looked like, or the yeah, the ASOS site looked like with the big orange tower and things like that. You can stretch out a ways. We got a lot of room to work with. But how many of you live at an airport? I live about one mile from the center of Lambert. So. Okay. So you're fairly close, yeah. but you're a mile away. You could be in a microclimate. Absolutely. We want your data, too. <laughs> and that's the discussion I continue to have with colleagues. Oh, the data from this station isn't the same as the data from the airport. Well, have you looked at where the station is actually located and noted that he is a hundred feet lower in a small valley and has a different set of rock around him than the airport does? Oh, you haven't. Gosh, you think this one might be representative of where he's located? I get in trouble for that sometimes, too. Yes? You mentioned microclimate, so uh, in a large airport like Atlanta or something like that, they have more than one National Weather Service weather station because, you know, because of the geographic spread of, no. They report one. one. There are a number of other sensors for wind shear and things of this nature out there, but they only report one data point. There's only a single datum for the official uh, Hartsfield uh, Atlanta is it Hartsfield anymore? I don't. Th I think they changed the name. Uh, but Atlanta Hartsfield only reports a single uh, datum for that, and that comes out of the Peachtree office. So for the CWAP siting, look at the guidelines. Look at best practices. We cite best best practices, and that's the NWS and WMO stuff. Don't intentionally bias your data. Oh yeah, I know, it's convenient to put your, uh, to put your data up, or put your uh, instrument up right next to the house. And that means you've got the best wireless path to get in. But if you do that, your, and your anemometer is right up against the eaves, or right on top of the house and two feet off. I saw one of these recently in a subdivision. The anemometer is perched up on a little short tripod right at the, on top of the house, you actually are biasing your data because you're getting a turbulent flow off the top of the house. So neither wind direction nor wind velocity are accurate there. They may end up being representative, but they're not accurate. Don't, don't do that to yourself intentionally. Put it in the backyard someplace and let it work. Or put it up to borrow a line from, yes? I was going to ask, so if you happen to have a tower by the house, what about, or what could or should be mounted off the side of the tower? Put a sidearm out. Uh, typically, I recommend, that, well, and the documents recommend the sidearm be directed to uh, True North and put the anemometer at the end of the sidearm. Uh, I'd, if you can go six feet, that's great. If you can't go six feet, three or four is good. Now, that's assuming you don't have a cell site on your tower as well that's blocking all the wind from the south. But you, you get the idea. Yeah, for something like Rhone 25, Rhone 45, sure, no problem. But yeah, you know, there, there's little tricks and tidbits. If you send me a picture and say, this is where I want to put the thing, I'll send you an answer back that says, that looks good, that doesn't look good. This is, you know, you might have a problem with that. Document all your installation information. Keep track of when you put the thing in, a date. It would be nice if you had it calibrated every year or two, because these instruments will drift. You'll see mechanical failures. That little needle bearing on your uh, cup anemometer, yeah, it'll go away. Periodically, you will see that the uh, uh, potentiometer that is used for the uh, direct wind direction will fail. 
when that happens. If you've had it serviced recently, they, then whoever did it probably looked at that, did the full check, and said, oh, this is going to fail, we'll replace it. But if it happens catastrophically and you didn't know it was going to happen, all of a sudden you're sitting there going, darn, my weather station's down, I hadn't planned on it being down, and we've got thunderstorms this week and I wanted to see what's going on. So it helps you to have the thing available too, not just us. Record your site information, your instrument information, and any calibration dates. That's, that, that's the takeaway there. This is actually not a bad installation. If you notice, outside of the possible proximity to power lines, but they've got the anemometry up high, and then they've got the other sensors down low at a reasonable height. Probably going to get pretty good data out of that. It's an, it open and away from most obstructions. Is it more than? Is it out of the even the out in the far field for uh, uh, for wind by our definition? Probably not. But I'm sure not going to complain about an installation like this from somebody volunteering data. On the other hand, if you translate it out to the middle of a field, you're going to be hard pressed to tell me that this is going to interfere with this in a significant fashion. You probably have a really good sight there. What about this one? <laughs> yeah, that one doesn't look too promising. There's power lines right in here. Uh, you've got this is an all-in-one station that is not one of my favorites. And in fact, the folks at Davis are just selling it because it's now popular, and if they could eliminate it, they, would, they said they would never have put it on the market. Which one's that? It's the Vantage View. They've had a few problems in uh, maintaining the things. They've had a few problems in the way people cite them. It looks like, oh, you can put it on, the, on your deck, and it'll be perfect. No. like that. It's about six feet off the deck. That implies that somewhere back over in this direction is a house with a lot of obstruction for your wind and probably you're going to see some biasing from uh, the temperature radiated from the brick or your hardy plank. <laughs> or your fireplace. Or your fireplace. That one might induce a little turbulence during the uh, cold weather. That, yeah, uh, that one's not probably giving too much useful information to the airport, were I to guess. This guy spent some time. Oh, and plug for non-citizen weather. Who all is Coca Ra's observer? One. Coca Ra's is a cooperative citizen science reporting system, every morning you get up, you read your Coca Ra's rain gauge and you enter it online. It used to be you just submitted a postcard. Now you get to do it online, once a day. Or if the rain gauge fills up because of, say, Harvey, you might do that several times in a day. That is one of the most successful citizen science programs for tracking rain and snow on, on record anywhere. Absolutely beautiful. So this is a heated tipping bucket. Standard 8-inch diameter, same thing the Weather Service uses. This is a Davis heated tipping bucket for rain and snow. Davis Vantage Pro 2 sensor with the aspirated uh, high flow fan so that you don't get any bias from uh, the temperature of the instrument cabinet. So you've got temperature and humidity in there. Inside the house is where the barometer is located. And they don't show the uh, anemometer because it too is almost professionally sighted. So how many do we have? Probably close, actually closer to 36,000 registered participants. Over 21,000 are active, submitting every day. At least 40 countries are represented. Typically, we see 13,000 or more stations per hour report. 
and that's over 100,000 reports per hour. The growth trend in the next graph, I'll warn you, is old, but the growth trend con is consistent. It's nearly linear, and it's really impressive that it continues to grow this way. The, the non-HAM citizen weather stations do take a, take a bump every time there's a major holiday. Somebody gives dad a new weather station, or mom a new weather station, or whoever a new weather station. Most of them put them on and we start seeing data. It's really pretty cool. Uh, ham stations are also on a linear growth pattern with a similar bump at uh, major holidays. Now the discontinuity here happened when we took citizen weather off of the ham radio APRS servers. And we had a period of about six months where we said, this is gonna happen, period of about three months where we said, this is gonna happen and the new servers are already in place, please start using them. And about a year and a half before everybody caught back up and went, I haven't seen my data forever. So, as I said, over 30,000 non-hams, uh, over 4,000 hams. The growth curves are good. This was just recent. On the 13th of September, I took a couple of seconds out from installing a new Cray and grabbed two, uh, uh, two quick uh, SQL queries. On that day, for one hour, I had 13,585 unique CWAP IDs, either call signs or the CWAP specific IDs. And at that point for the day, it was probably 19 or 20 Z, so 19 or 20 hours into the day. We merely had 1.34 million reports. That's a lot of reports. So we have 10 APRS core servers. There's about 90 regional servers for tier two scattered all over the world. They have more diversity than the core servers, although we're even getting better. Those are for the ham radio participants. That's for APRS and for citizen, uh, the citizen weather reports. Some non-hams have broken the authentication code. We, it's not really a security code. It's just the best we can do and satisfies the FCC. Okay. I don't have to enforce that. I do check if you send me a note saying I need the passcode for uh, using my call sign on uh, APRS. I will check to make sure that your uh, identity as represented in your email matches QRZ, at least. In some cases, if I don't like what I see, I'll probably pick up the phone and call you and verify. So when I get these requests, I actually do something with it. And I've turned down a couple of people who went, what's ham radio? What's your call sign? What's a call sign? Then why are you asking for an ID for what looks like a valid amateur radio identificator, uh, identifier? Well, I thought I had to invent one. <laughs> no, let's talk about how to get this station registered. So the uh, Tier 2 servers, Tier 2 has a, a series of distributed uh, servers all over the world. Then they have a core of their own, and they report to their core. Their core all intercommunicates and reports to the APRS core servers, which is where Steve is uh, gathering all of the citizen weather data from and all the APRS data that he mines. And then we also have the CWAP servers, he samples each one of those as well. And then I have two aggregation servers. All of the CWAP data comes into the CWAP servers. All, anything resembling a weather report from ham radio, uh, APRS, core, or tier two, ends up on the citizen weather servers. And then eventually ends up on the aggregation servers, where I've got databases and where I handle the data and can pull numbers like uh, 1.34 million uh, samples in a day. Find you queries all the core servers and all the CWAP servers and uploads the data to Matus every 15 minutes. 
and then made us perform slow magic through statistical math, uh, and mathematical means. So we look at uh, temperature, humidity, and pressure for the full three-level uh, three quality checks. And for wind, we look at velocity, not the direction, because direction is too variable. Gosh, that comes back to figuring out what critical frequencies are again. Precipitation is not well suited for quality checking. Precipitation is not well suited for quality checking at the National Weather Service level, although we do something approximating it, and it's a mean and ugly approach, and I'm not going to go into it right now. It's, uh, I was brought in to look at some of the statistics and GIS uh, sampling methods for that a long time ago as an academic, and uh, never could change the bureaucracy much. So level one's a validity check. Are the, you know, if, if your temperature is below absolute zero or above the temperature of the sun, we're probably going to throw it out. <laughs> Internal consistency. So is it consistent with itself? Is your temperature or your pressure or your humidity been varying within a certain range and suddenly spiked way outside of that? Well, it might get flagged. That doesn't mean it's necessarily bad. If you have a fast-moving front come across and you drop 60 degrees, and yes, I've seen a 60-degree Fahrenheit drop with frontal passage in a matter of three minutes, it's going to get flagged. Doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means that was an unusual event, and if a competent meteorologist looks at it, they're going to go, wow, that was impressive. We look for temporal consistency, the same sort of thing. If it, mo if it changes too rapidly, it is likely a sensor failure or an extreme meteorological phenomenon. And then is it spatially consistent with its neighbors? And then we do a, m a more refined spatial consistency with all of the nearest neighbors that we have within a given range. Matus.noaa.gov has the information on this. So the data are flagged. We don't get rid of anything. It's not our job to get rid of data. All data are sacred. We, all data are precious to us. That's just the way we think. There are some folks out there who disagree. And the uh, folks who uh, take care of the seagoing buoys, well, their data are very consistent, but they're not always right. The end user decides what to keep and what to discard. Why? We talked about microclimates. Microclimates are a fact of life, and when you get a high enough density of stations, you start identifying those. And that's something that people haven't considered because in meteorology over time, we've thought about, generally thought about forecasting in the synoptic scale, the huge overall scale, or even a global scale. And when we do that, we don't worry about the guy in the valley that, you know, there are three houses in the valley because that's the size of the valley, but he's got a different meteorological environment than I do sitting next to the lake. And, you know, spatially occurring outliers get flagged. That, the guy on the ridge that I talked about at 6,400 feet, well, yeah, his wind velocity was always much higher than everybody else and his temperature lower because his nearest neighbors were 3,000 feet below him. It's a big difference. The way the data, is com data comes from Matus, the files are accumulated, and they're sent out every, about every five minutes, but they are just augmented. So you don't have a full data set until the hour is complete, and then they start another one. We've argued about that. I would rather see them send a partial record every five minutes or every 15 minutes. For me, that would make a whole lot more sense because of the work I'm doing professionally. But that would require changes, and changes would require paperwork and time, and neither of those is in uh, abundant supply. Yes? Did I hear a question? Uh, so reports from some, from some providers are significantly delayed. There are people who sit on their data for an hour or two before they send it to Matus. Matus accepts it anyway, takes their timestamp. They take our timestamp, but when does your timestamp go on to a citizen weather observation? 
Anybody want to guess? When you send it. When we get it into the system. Not exactly the same. Because I don't trust your PC and your Windows operating system to have a valid time server. Historically, that was a reasonable concern. There were, at the time we made that decision, there were probably no more than a dozen people reporting who were running Linux and who could be guaranteed to have actual NTP servers that meant something. Windows at that time had a rather unique approach to, oh, we'll set the PC clock once every week or so from our own time servers, which are never set to anything reliable. That, ran, that, that caused problems. We still see something like this because occasionally clocks will get screwed up when, on the radar data that we get from the individual radar sites. And I'll have radar now that's reporting it's in the future. <laughs> that creates real havoc, and in that case, we do correct the, uh, in, in the radar case, in the weather service, they do go back in and correct the official time record on that to reflect when it really happened. Because otherwise, we have trouble making it work on our workstations. Question. Yes. Um, as you're, you try to resolve down the, the frequency of observation to the, the pick up critical data, will future weather stations include a GPS to uh, get the accurate time? We're willing to accept the latency it, it takes to get from I just recorded this and I'm sending it to you right now and the time it hits the server. When it hits the first server, be it tier two, APRS core, or citizen weather, that's when it gets, that's when it gets a timestamp. And as I mentioned earlier, virtually all of these servers are in a data center environment and 100% of them are looking at good NTP service. So yeah, we might have milliseconds, we're not going to resolve weather observations to the millisecond level anytime soon. I'll be perfectly happy if I could get 30 second data. So that, you know, I don't think we need to worry about that. Would I like to have the GPS data for other things? I'd love it. I'd love to be able to take a, a sample once a day or four times a day and over the per a period of six months or five years, figure out where you really are as opposed to where you told me you were. But that brings up another interesting point. One of the biggest complaints I, I see on, uh, when people are reporting their position is, my reported position is off by uh, 30 meters. One of the decisions made in the spec was that for the weather data, we were going to obscure some of the location precision because we had a number of people, do you remember this, John, back when back in the, the good old days when people were going, I'm going to put this tracker in my, on my car, but I really don't want people to know where I am. If you're within about 100 meters, I consider it good enough. If, you're, if your station is plotting to the house next door, I'm sorry it doesn't look like it's your house on Google Maps, but that's close enough. That's the best we can do because we're only getting two significant digits in the minute in position. I'll take it. Could we do better? Oh yeah, you, you, you want to give me really high resolution, high, uh, uh, extend the precision out, fine. But then you'd better extend your accuracy of positioning all, uh, as well. I, I know how to get down to two centimeters horizontal with a GPS. Do you? So where are the data used? Operationally, at the National Centers for Environmental Pre uh, Prediction, citizen weather data gets plugged into the global forecast system and its an ensemble brethren. Ensembles are a means where we take a model and then we change initial conditions and uh, a little bit, tweak the initial conditions and some of the physics sometimes, and we run this model a dozen times or three dozen times, or in this case, uh, the GEFs is uh, four sets of 20 models that have initial conditions tweaked on the tw uh, to create the 20 models, and then physics tweaked for the four sets to get to a total of 80 uh, ensemble members. 
High resolution rapid refresh, uh, the HER model, is run once an hour. It's a three kilometer model across the continental United States and is used for severe weather forecasting. The project I'm working on initializes with the HER and then tries to get an even finer grained model for a local area where we believe storms are going to occur. So it's used operationally in HER and the GFS and GIFs. Uh, the National Weather Service routinely uses citizen weather data for event verification. Uh, in Florida, back when they had a citrus uh, program there, the uh, data from citizen weather was routinely used for citrus freeze warnings. Event verification is, is a big issue for us. Uh, anybody remember the water taxi incident in Baltimore a couple of years ago? Had a uh, thunderstorm, uh, a line of thunderstorms come across, flip a water taxi, and there were some fatalities. There's several stories involved with that, but that was actually observed on Citizen Weather, and the Weather Service office at uh, Baltimore was trying to get the warning out at the time and had telecommunications problems. National Hurricane Center uses Citizen Weather for verification and data assimilation into their models. Where does Citizen Weather go with Hurricane Katrina? The very first weather station to come out of the Katrina devastated area was a uh, citizen weather station, a ham operator in Baton Rouge, was up within 24 hours. That was the very first, and for, for that matter, the only reliable weather station report we had for almost three weeks. So, yeah, it's useful. The Warn on Forecast program is the program that I'm working on. We're trying to in improve the uh, forecasting of severe weather events, tornadoes, thunderstorms, that sort of thing, so that we can actually forecast it up to an hour before the actual event occurs. We use citizen weather data, although we decimate the heck out of it, because if we get too many uh, ground observations, it actually induces noise into the model and confuses the, the model. It's not a citizen weather problem. That means we don't understand how to assimilate data better. At the Global Systems Division, the people who own MATIS, or once did, they do the development on the high resolution rapid refresh, and they're doing a 16 model ensemble run called the HER E. HER Ensemble. There's a whole bunch of uh, university research programs scattered across the country that are utilizing citizen weather data. Uh, Meso West at the University of Utah is one of the most obvious and most prominent in that, but I know of at least two dozen that I could name off the top. NASA utilizes citizen weather data as surface observations and verification in some of their research programs. Yes, they do a lot of climate and a lot of uh, meteorology. Homeland Security in, uh, incorporates these data if they have to do a plume analysis or a plume forecast for a, a chemical release or a biological release. Municipal uh, agencies and organizations use this when they've got wildfires or they've got a local chemical release. The list just goes on. Matus went operational about five years ago. I've got a, something missing in there. That was a rather contentious uh, deal about five, probably about seven years ago. Rather contentious operation to uh, take it to the National Center for Environmental Prediction. There was actually a plan put forth by NSEP that said we'll have Raytheon take over the program, completely rewrite it from scratch, and try and recover all of the data you've, rec uh, you've recorded over the years. That didn't work very, very well. Uh, the data go to the, uh, the uh, various observing systems and information workstations. AWIPS, now AWIPS 2, is the uh, automated weather information and processing system that sits on, on every forecaster's uh, workstation. I don't know how to put this gracefully, but it's in its second incarnation right now, AWIPS 2, and we're hoping AWIPS 4 will come along very soon. AWIPS 3 has already died a horrible death. Um, 
as as I've said, you know, where did it go? It went into the wrap. The rapid refresh uh, is what the wrap is, and you'll still see that occasionally. And it 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 is assimilated in there on an hourly basis, and then verification of events. Verification is important. LDM, the Unidata uh, Local Data uh, Manager and inter Internet Data Distribution System, was started by a group at the uh, university's Corporation for Atmospheric Research called Unidata. Their charge was to get meteorological data to the universities and uh, education outlets of the world, and they've done a pretty good job of it. Now, LDM is actually used by universities all over the world. I've helped set up uh, systems in uh, the Caribbean and in uh, South America. I consulted on one in, uh, in, in Europe a couple of years ago. And the hardest one I ever had to set up was in Monterey, California at uh, the Naval Research Lab because I didn't have the right security clearances. Private sector is using LDM. They're getting their data the same way. It's, a, it's called a publish subscribe system. If you're familiar with that method of uh, moving data around, you tell it what you want and it sends it to you. Weather enthusiasts can get access to uh, data via LDM. The Matus feed is on that. About 2008, it officially went operational, or it, it was scheduled for transition, and it took almost, almost four years to get there. INSEP administers MATIS officially. They do the Tier 1 and Tier 2 support. In other words, the Weather Service and NCEI, the National Center for, Centers for Environmental Inter Information, talk to them. NCEI houses the data. For those of you familiar with it, this used to be the National Climatic Data Center. They changed the name because the name had been around for long enough that it was well recognized, I think. <laughs> and yeah, I, I can be a little cynical at times. Um, the uh, folks in Boulder at the Global Systems Division are responsible for systems improvements and making the change requests when they have significant improvements. They do the research and development they do the Tier 3 support, which includes the uh, citizen weather folks calling in and getting registered. When you send email to CWAP support, one person is uh, likely to be your primary point of interaction there, although there are about a dozen of us who see the data or see the email and any of us can and may respond. But if it's a very straightforward, I want to register and everything is in, in good shape, then Leah Cheatwood is going to be the only one you talk to. If you talk to Randy uh, Collender or me, more than likely you've got a problem and we're either going to help you or tell you to go read the manual again. <laughs> the operational server is in College Park, Maryland, except when it's uh, backed up at Boulder. And when it's backed up at Boulder, they turn off the College Park server and you have to... Uh, go to the Boulder server. They don't turn the Boulder server on except when it's up as uh, the operational server. So you can confuse your LDM installation if you're getting it that way uh, because of the way they're doing that operational management. So we've talked about the data about the data. What do we need? What do we, you know, this is, this is the basic information that I've identified as what CWAP metadata needs to look like. Uh, location in latitude, longitude, and altitude. You give me a choice, I'm gonna want Cartesian coordinates from the Earth's centroid, but they don't usually let me go that, that way. Nearest city or town, and we'd like a country, if you're not from CONUS, please. Uh, station type, so is it a Davis, or you know, Vantage View, Vantage Pro, Pete Brothers, whatever, uh, Weisla WXT520, Weisla, uh Tactical a, uh, ASOS, whatever you've got. Let us know what it is so that we can document that. The installation information, when did it go in, how did it go in. Calibration data, if you have to take it down for recalibration or maintenance, let us know the dates of that. Siting details, including problems with siting. So I wasn't able to get to 33 feet, but I could get to 28 feet. Okay, we can document that, that's great. Photos of the installation, because photos are worth a thousand words. And then how do we get a hold of you? Do you have any affiliated websites where we can point people to or where we can go and look at your data? 
and a request. You're driving down the street and you see a new weather station. If you've got a camera that gets GPS coordinates, I don't care what the address is, take a picture of it, send it to me. We'll, we will see if it's in, a, in there and we'll add it to that station's list of metadata because they may not have sent us any pictures. We're not going to tell anybody where it is. We're just going to go, hmm, CW0103. That's great. Now we've got better documentation on them. So the main site to go to, because CWAP.com.org, et cetera, was already stolen, is WXQA.com. Sorry about that. It's not intuitively obvious, but it, it's what we came up with. To get information on actually joining, go to signup.html and take a look at, uh, for the quality reporter information, weather.gladstonefamily.net. Those are the pertinent sites to start with. Questions? Then this is important. How much of a break do you want to take Let's take about 20 minutes. Well, they are taking a 20 minute break. You can take as long as you want and then come back for part two of the Sunday seminar. That will be in Ham Radio Now, episode 373 on a computer or a TV screen or a Roku or whatever phone. <laughs> Watching this on a phone, that'll be a trial uh, near you. Ham Radio Now brought to you by you, Arvin invites you to uh, stop by the website and click the pig and help us out financially and keep these programs on the air. No Kickstarter for this one, so your contributions are especially important. And that is it for this episode. Again, stay tuned for part two, next episode following immediately. <laughs> Try that again. Following immediately over most of this same station. Over and out. So I have to ask, if I'm a pacer, will that give you a problem? No. Okay. It's more work. Just checking. <laughs>